Amen. Amen. Uh, I've preached a lot of times over the years out of Matthew's Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew's kind of Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, but I've never used this text from Luke that I can recall uh, before. In fact, it says some things that are a little concerning to me, uh, quite honestly, uh, and it really causes me to look very deeply into my own heart, be more discerning about my personal motives. And I pray it will do the same for you today as well. And as I read through the text today, I'm just going to warn Johnny back here that I'm going to be stopping. So you're going to, I'm sorry, but you're going to stay awake today. Not that he ever falls asleep. But you know, the best person in the sound booth is the one you don't know is there. You know that, right? So you've got one of the best back there. So I hope you know that. When you, when you know the sound is off, that's when the sound man gets in trouble. And uh, it never happens around here. So thanks be to God. But we're starting from Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 17. And uh, it says this. It says, He went down with them and stood on a level place. And a large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed by their diseases. So I'm going to stop right here for just a moment. So we, we see that Jesus was drawing large crowds. And uh, while some came to hear him speak, others came to be healed of their afflictions and or diseases by the touch of Christ. And when you, when you need something from God, you know you will go to great lengths, great lengths to get close to God. When you have a need, you press in. Amen? It's not just me, right? When you, when you know you have a need, you spend a little more time in prayer. You, you are willing to ask others to pray for you. You, you, you go to greater lengths. You, you do more than you do normally because you know that you have a need. And so if you're not willing to go to great lengths to hear and be touched by God, you really can't expect anything from God. I mean, that's, that's honest. So we're called to seek the Lord while we may yet be found and seek Him with all our heart. Amen? So going on to verse 8, those troubled by evil spirits were cured, or delivered if you will, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing some of them. No, that's not what it says, is it? It says healing them all, every one of them that needed the healing was healed. Those possessed of the devil were delivered, and everyone that was touched by Jesus was cured of the things that ailed them. In fact, it says power was coming from Jesus and he was healing them all. Jesus didn't heal only certain races of people. He healed them all equally. It's true that mainly the Jews were coming to hear Jesus speak. That's true. But Jesus didn't deny anybody healing. In fact, he healed them all. Rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, all were healed and asked of him. Now, he gave some a little grief over, over the time just to kind of mess with them and, and mess with his, I think probably mess with his disciples more than mess with the people that asked for healing. But I wasn't there, so I can't say that for sure, but that's a speculation. But in fact, those who had the greatest faith were often Gentiles, such as the centurion who wanted a healing for his servant that was ill. And Jesus said, sure, I'll come with you. He said, Master, you don't have to come with me. I am a man over armies. I say something and they go. He said, you speak it and it will be done. And Jesus said, greater faith have I not found in, in all of Israel than this Gentile. That's saying something. But it said, the Bible says that he was healed at that moment. His servant was healed at that moment. Jesus is going to go around healing people, most of whom have little or nothing. And he's healing them because God loves all people and truly cares about our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And God hasn't just dumped humanity here on earth and left us here to die. God cares deeply for humanity and desires to bless and keep you in his divine care. Precisely why Jesus said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Does that mean your life will be perfect? Sorry, no. Absolutely not. In fact, Jesus goes on to explain that he's not going to fix everything in those people's lives. We'll get to that in a little bit. But, but we find that if we are willing to press into the presence of God, in his presence we will always find peace for our souls and a healing for our souls. And by pressing in, I mean seeking to be in his presence of spiritual, of this spiritual triune God. And this, this God says to all who will listen, he says, seek me while I may yet be found. He is a caring and loving God that, 
that says, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Seek him for the sake of being in his presence, and you will find healing for your physical, mental, and emotional needs. We do know, we know for believers that there are times when God does not heal completely. It's a fact. For Paul, God left some affliction with Paul. We know that from Paul's writings. And Paul stated that it was to keep him humble. We don't know necessarily what the affliction was. We think it maybe had to do something with his eyes, but we don't know that. Paul called this thing a thorn in the flesh. And we think it was the vision, but like I said, we don't know. Regardless of where... Uh, where there are times when God doesn't heal believers of every illness, and when this is the case, we need to know that God's grace in that time is sufficient for us. That's hard to say sometimes, that God's grace is sufficient for me when we're going through trials or tribulations or suffering some ailment. For Paul, it was to keep him humble. For us, it might be to allow us to witness to our faith to someone in the healthcare industry or another patient that we might come in contact with. Regardless, there are times in God's sovereignty that we may remain ill in order to serve Him better in some form or fashion. Just remember that next time you think God has abandoned you and you feel destitute and left out, that He will never leave you, He will never forsake you, but He will sometimes allow you to go through some trials in order to reach others with His message of love and grace. We are the vessels of God to be used by God. And if we have fully submitted to God, we are willingly wanting to lay down our lives and serve Him. And sometimes there's some sacrifice in that. Amen? That brings me to a concept that has really messed up our Western churches today. Many Americans today have bought into the world's idea that money is how you can tell if you are blessed of God. And the term used in the world is successful. We have connected that with blessed. So that if I say I am blessed, most people in churches think, well, that means God's given him money. That's not what blessed means in Scripture. But we have connected those terms together to where they're almost synonymous. And when we say that, people think, well, that means they're financially Doing great. So when we hear the word successful in the world, we consider that it to mean wealthy. Now, most American believers has been well off for so long that we might be tempted to look at those who are poor and forget, if not for the grace of God, there go I. You ever said that? Driving around in places, and you look over and you see a tar paper shack, and you say to yourself, if not for the grace of God, there go I. Biblically speaking, the only reason any believer has God-given wealth is so that they can be a blessing to others in need. It was said that Abraham was blessed, and I quote, to be a blessing. That's why God blessed Abraham. He didn't want Abraham just to keep it all himself. He wanted Abraham to be a blessing for others. Believers are given blessings from God by his mercy and grace so that we can bless others. And as much as God has blessed us and provided for all our needs, we can lose it all in a moment. And we will someday if God ever decides to judge the nation of America. Russia, I believe, was judged not long ago. You might remember the pictures. People were waiting in line for food. There was nothing in grocery stores. You couldn't, there was nothing on shelves. How many remember those, those images? You remember those? I believe they were judged as a nation. It could happen to us someday. But listen very carefully what I'm about to share. Even if we were to lose every monetary thing we are entrusted with, we would still be blessed of God because the blessings of God are not monetary. That's our system, not God's system. Many people in Jesus' day were struggling, and most of them, most of the people he's speaking to, walked to get there. 
They walked because most didn't own any other real means of transportation other than their own two feet. And so while people were looking around in the crowd and making judgments as to who was blessed of God in their minds and who was there for selfish reasons, in verse 22, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says this. He said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Just stop for just a moment. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, to a poor person who has just inherited heaven through the words of Christ, that's some shouting stuff going on right there. That's, that's worth saying, thanks be to God. I just inherited, I just, I did even better than winning the national lottery. I just inherited eternal life with God in heaven. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Suddenly, everybody that was poor was worth more than all the money in the world, and they had just inherited the kingdom. To everyone who thinks money here on earth makes them rich, Jesus is stating a new concept that even though someone is poor, if they have the kingdom of God in their hearts, they will inherit that kingdom one day. Listen, when you have nothing and Jesus makes you a co-heir of heaven, you've just received so much, so much. You've received eternal security, which nobody can ever take away from you. Believers are blessed of God in so many ways. Never let money be your litmus test of anybody's eternal or external sign of blessing. Not anyone, including yourself. Don't tell yourself that you're anything less because of what you have or don't have physically or financially. Ours is a life of the Spirit and eternity. Jesus went on to talk about the things that the poor were worried about, the things that made them feel like God wasn't concerned about them. In verse 21, he said, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Many of these people went to bed hungry at night, and they were rarely, if ever, satisfied in their flesh. I don't really think that many of us here have had to deal with that reality in a long, long time. And if I turn sideways, you'll know I haven't in quite some time. <laughs> many of us will not be able to relate with what this definition of blessing really truly means to the poor and the downtrodden. But I can assure you it was very encouraging to them. Those who live without knew these words of Christ. And they, they just sock, sopped them up like a, like a sponge. Jesus was encouraging the poor. He was feeding them. He was letting them know that the kingdom of God is concerned about them. And they have a place in the kingdom of heaven. Even though in society they were ostracized and they were removed from the clubs and people looked down on them and treated them terrible. But in heaven, they would be somebody. That's encouraging. We might be able to better relate to the next part in verse 21. Where Jesus said this. He said, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. This would have triggered every Jew's memory of Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, where we read this. And this won't be on the overhead, mind you. In Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, it says, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but joys, rejoicing comes in the morning. Rejoicing comes in the morning. Jesus was re Reminding the people of a promise of God that would bring them joy one day. And very few of these people around Jesus could have hoped for really a lot of joy in their lifetime. But Jesus promised them a future where laughing and joy and plenty. Oh, it would be the reality. It would be their eternity. You know, this is as close to heaven as unbelievers are going to get. Think about that. This is as good as it gets for them. But this is as close to hell as believers are going to be. Thanks be to God. It just gets better from here, people. It does. It just gets better. May we never lose sight of this reality. And may the joy of the Lord continue to be our strength at all times. Not just in the times of plenty. There's uh, certainly one area where we won't naturally feel very blessed. And that's when people hate or despise or exclude us from their little clubs. And everybody wants to be liked by others, but 
Dividing people has become the devil's number one weapon to hurt and harm a free society today. And he's, he's busy. The devil's been doing this for a long time, and it's, it, it always becomes evident when any community is void of the presence of Christ. And uh, just know that you don't need to be void of Christ also, and you can always be blessed of God. Verse 22 says this. Jesus is saying, Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Listen, when people hate you because you claim to be a follower of Christ, you are blessed of God. You won't feel blessed, but you are blessed of God if they hate you because the name of Christ is in you. It won't seem like you are blessed if you take it personally. But when you realize that they are not attacking you, but the Christ in you, you can understand and know that you are blessed to be counted as a true believer of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus tells us to rejoice on that day, verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how they treated, that is how your fathers treated the prophets, Matthew says, who went before you. Listen to me for a moment. We Americans have got to learn to rejoice because the knowledge of our future reward is in here. We've got to remember that. We've got to rejoice. Bad things are going to happen to you, so what? <laughs> rejoice! And again I say rejoice, for the kingdom of heaven is yours. You might have a day where, yeah, something went wrong a little bit. Big deal! It's one stinking day out of eternity. Get over it. Suck it up, buttercup. Keep your eye on the prize, the future. The future is glorious. It's, it's eternity with God. Never forget that. Never forget that. Never forget that. I pray that we, we don't have to lose everything we, we have to learn that it can be done. It can be done. You can praise God in the good. You can praise God in the bad. Some of you may remember the various apostles that were imprisoned. And they had the crazy ability to praise God while they're sitting in chains, detained in a dark, nasty, dirty dungeon. When you're judged by others for being a believer, you need to shout for joy and praise God because there are people that call themselves believers that will never be accused of following Jesus Christ. Those that literally suffer for Christ will have a special reward in heaven that others do not. What is that reward? I don't know for sure. But I do know that when we stand before Christ, our sacrifices made for Him will be more precious than diamonds or golds or rubies here on earth. God values our obedience more than we value gold and silver. I want to say that again. God values our obedience more than we value gold or silver. And next time you're making a decision on something that might cause you to question whether or not to be obedient to God, remember the statement, God values our obedience more than we value gold or silver. And I must value obedience as well if I'm going to follow Christ. And so doing, you're storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, where thieves can't break and steal. When you are obedient, sacrificially, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's, you know what? It is a 401k that the government can never get to when you store up for yourself treasure in heaven. It is an eternal retirement account that one day when you stand before Christ and he says, hey, what'd you do for me while you were down there? You'll lay it before him and present it to him at that time. He'll recall it. You'll recount it. You'll talk about it. As Americans, we need to take heed of the next verses, verse 24. But woe to you who are rich. And I told you I wrestled with some stuff. This was, this was part of it. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Jesus is speaking to all the well-off countries and people of the world, and we are, we are just that in this country in America. Do you know that the loose change you have on your dresser is more than a third of the people in the world have?
just the loose change on your dresser. One third of the people of this world have less than that. Let that soak in a minute. The U.S. has been one of the richest countries in the world for numerous decades. And is, is Jesus saying that somebody with money can't enter heaven? No. Because Jesus says in a different place, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. However, he says, with God, all things are possible. He's not saying that a wealthy can't enter heaven. I mean, he blessed Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. He blessed them like crazy financially, but they were blessed to be a blessing. He wanted to use them, so he blessed them so that they could be blessing others. And they could be ministering on his behalf in, in various ways. So, wealthy people will, can and will enter heaven because they were faithful with God and trusted them. With the things God entrusted them with, excuse me. They, they were blessed and they were faithful to be a blessing to others. Now, if you ever saw the movie, how many see, saw the movie Schindler's List? Anybody ever saw it? If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Partly because they're trying to cancel that it ever happened. You need to see it as a historical reality. And watch it to the end where you see the people, the children of those that were saved through Schindler's actions. When they come and they thank you personally, you need to see that. It'll rock your world. If you saw it, great. If you didn't, let me just give you just a quick history on it. Uh, in the latter part of the movie, Mr. Schindler, for those of you who don't know, he was a businessman. He owned a munitions plant in Germany during World War II. Schindler realized that the German government was physically killing Jews, so he chose to bribe German officials and they would allow him to take a few Jews and put them to work in the munitions plant. So Schindler was buying Jews to save them from the horrible camps and the death gas chambers that they were going to. And when Schindler realized that his plant was about to be overrun by the Allies, they had come into Germany, and uh, he, was, he decided in the middle of the night, they got a hold of him, they said that the Allies are coming, you need to leave in the middle of the night before they, he said, you know, we don't know how they're gonna treat you, we need to explain to them what you've done for us, and that you physically saved us, and that you were actually a savior for us. But he said, you need to get out, and this was his accountant he's talking with, a guy that he knew, he was a personal friend. He was a Jewish man. He said, you need to leave before they get here so that we have time to explain what you have done, what you have really done in this place. And so as he's leaving in the night, uh, as he was getting into his car, he had a short conversation with this, this accountant friend of his, who was in fact at his head accountant. Schindler knew that the war was over, and he was looking back at all that he had done, thinking, okay, I'm looking back. Did I do everything I could do? And he says, and he's looking at the faces of the Jews there, and he's thinking, there are more that, didn't, that I didn't save. And he says this. He said, I could have done more. I could have sold my car and bought two more Jews. And, and he said, I could have, and he pulls his ring off. He said, I, I could have sold this. And, and he said, I could have had one more Jew. I could have bought one. And his friend says to Schindler, Schindler, he says, look around you. He says, look into the faces of those that you have saved. And know that they would be dead had you done nothing. Know that. They are grateful for all that you have done. And we are alive because of you. And we'll tell the allies of your, of your work and your bravery and what you have done for us. However, you need to go before they get here. You need to go. And he finally gets in the car and he goes. But the point I'm trying to drive home is this. When it's all said and done, when it's all over, and judgment comes, which is what Schindler was facing. The Allies are coming in. Judgment's coming. And he said, have I done everything I could possibly do? And he's thinking about that. There will come a day for us all when we'll all stand before God and say something similar to what Schindler did. We'll say, I could have served, saved another soul. I could have used my wealth to reach many others. And, and like Schindler, we'll feel some remorse for not doing everything that we could have done, perhaps. And this is what Jesus is trying to explain to us. There will come a day when the wealthy will lose their wealth and enter the kingdom of God with only that which they have done for others, waiting there for them. For all that we do for others, that's what's stored up for us in heaven where the moth and rust cannot destroy and the thieves cannot break in and steal. Jesus wants us to get this 
before we face the judgment, before we face Christ, so that we are properly prepared for that day. And in our text, Jesus goes on to say, Woe to you, in verse 25, Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Jesus is trying to get his hearers to keep the future kingdom in mind and not lose sight of the eternal picture. It's very easy to be only concerned about ourselves and, and what we can see in this physical realm at the cost of forgetting our future. But Jesus has always taught his hearers that we must remember everything in life has eternal ramifications. And for the people that want to be liked by unbelievers, Jesus says in verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. His point here is that when unbelievers speak highly of you, it might be because you're telling them exactly what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. Because when you tell people what it is they need to hear, they might not want to hear it. And they may not say nice things about you. I want you to know there are times when you must tell people things that they don't want to hear. And if you speak the truth, there will be people that, that don't like you because you do it. They crucified our Lord. Why should they treat us any differently? They will say bad things about you, and they will leave you and go to others that will tell them what they want to hear. But that doesn't mean we set out to hurt people or upset people, but instead we speak the truth in love, and when the Holy Spirit directs us to do so especially, and we let people receive or deny the truth, it's up to them what they do with it. We don't demand it. We don't shove it down their throat. We share it because we care. You cannot be responsible for how people receive truth. You are responsible to share it in love, however. When I was serving the churches of Bacola Camera, my first, first pulpit in the Methodist Church, uh, it's a little, couple little towns just outside of Fort Smith, kind of south, just on the Oklahoma side of Fort Smith, Arkansas. I was asked to do a funeral for a family that didn't have any pastoral connections. Uh, I was on a rotational call with a couple funeral homes in Fort Smith, and they would call occasionally when families wanted the pastor to officiate a service, but none of them knew a pastor or attended a church anywhere. And on one occasion, I was called to meet with a family, and it was obvious this family didn't know God and had spent their lives getting stoned and high to kill the pain of hopelessness. And when it came to death, they, I'm telling you, they were rocked because they didn't have any future hope. You, you want to see the people that are most affected by death. You, you look at people that have no hope in the future, no hope in an eternity, and you will hear how bad it hurts. So they were distraught, really had no hope for getting through this young person's death. And I remember going home after talking with the family and on the way home praying to God, God, you're going to have to help me with this. I have no idea. How do I give people who don't know Christ hope? How do I do that? The Holy Spirit told me to share my testimony with them. I, I got to tell you, when I heard that in the car, I said, oh, God, are you sure? Really? You, Lord, do you know who these people are? I started negotiating with God because I did not want to share my testimony with that group. I just didn't. I didn't want to tell this family about my experience because I was afraid they would not want to hear it. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, you've heard me do funerals. I don't, I don't do altar calls at funerals. I don't beat people up over their lack of knowing Jesus. I do share Christ briefly, but I don't berate. I don't put down. I don't, you know, I've been in funerals where it's a half hour message and 10 minute altar call. And, and I don't do that. I'm very careful and cautious about how I do things. And I don't think I should bring any more pain to people than they already have. But at the same time, I need to offer hope. And so in Eastern Oklahoma, when you do that, and the service is over, and the pastor, whoever's officiating, goes down and stands at the head of the casket. Typically, the casket's open, people file by. I can tell you I have always had stink eye from at least two people at funerals in eastern Oklahoma. When I say stink eye, I have people just shoot that hateful look right at me as they walk by like, rah, rah. And you know what hate's looking at you, don't you? I mean, you know when somebody has hate for you. You can see the contempt in their eyes. And so I'm thinking on the way home, God says, I want you to share your testimony. I'm thinking, Lord, not with this group. They might kill me right on the spot. Because, I mean, I had, I always knew somebody was going to shoot me stink eyes. Somebody might even say, rawr, rawr. 
The people that knew me said, oh, thank you, Pastor. You know, but those are the people who are going to love you no matter what you say. But the people who don't know you might hate you for what you say. And I'm telling you, I took a lot of over there. It happens to here, around here occasionally, but I'm telling you over there, you can count on about two of them shooting you the stink guy on the way by. So anyway, I said enough about that. I wrestled with what to say to this group, but I knew I had to tell my testimony if I was going to be faithful. So I told my testimony in the third person, thinking that people would blow it off as, what does this guy know about somebody, you know, who's, who's had a background, who's had some, who's doing drugs and alcohol and, and the parties and all that. And, it, and I said at the end of the message, I said, and I can tell by looking at among the group. I said, I've been pastoring for long enough. I said, I can tell by looking out that many of you are thinking, what does this clean cut pastor know about the topic he's speaking about? What does he know about this? And I said, you should know that I'm the man that I was speaking about. That's me. And if God can take my life and clean it up and use it in some way, God can do the same for anybody who wants hope for a future and who needs to, to come out from under the addictions and the, and the hardships and the and the evil of that lifestyle that just pushes you down further and further and further. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for anyone that comes to him with an honest and serious heart. And after the service, I stood at the head of the casket, and I expected to, I mean, I was ready to dodge a punch. I was ready for a lot of things. But for the first time ever in any funeral service I had done up to that point, not only did I not get stink eye, but I had numerous people say, thank you for sharing your story. I needed some hope. I know what it means to be fearful to tell people the truth. I know what it means to be worried about taking a shot in the face or the gut or wherever they might throw a punch. I know what that feels like. I know how your gut turns and kind of stirs and if you got an ulcer, it flares. But there will also be times when people will tell you, thank you. I needed to hear that. And I want to close with what was read from the book of Jeremiah earlier. Chapter 17, verse 5, 7 and 10. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. End quote. God will reward those who earnestly seek him, and one day God will bless those who carry out his will on this earth. Do we want to be blessed of God? That we need to live our lives in complete obedience to the words and the will of God, and you will be blessed for all eternity. But the question is, do we want to be blessed of God or blessed of man? It's rare you can have both. It's typically one or the other. Scripture says you cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. That doesn't mean we are at war with the world. We are in a spiritual war that is 